Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. We are less than two weeks away from War for the Planet of the Apes, the third movie in the series since the 2011 reboot. And yet another franchise that will not die. But in this case, I'm okay with that because I like these movies. Well, usually. Of course, the Planet of the Apes franchise has always been very hit and miss. I'm sure I don't need to tell most of you about the history of Planet of the Apes, but we do have to do the obligatory Sean rambles on about history before getting to the goddamn review already segment, so let's get on with it. It all started way back in 1968 with the original Planet of the Apes movie, based on the 1963 French novel by Pierre Boulle and directed by Franklin J. Schaffner. Charlton Heston plays astronaut George Taylor, who crash lands on an unknown planet about 2,000 years in the future, and finds the planet is largely populated by apes and humans. But unlike the world he came from, apes are the highly intelligent and dominant species, while humans are so primitive they can't even speak. Taylor is captured by the apes and turned over to scientists Zira and Cornelius, played respectively by Kim Hunter and Roddy McDowell, for experimentation. He's even assigned a mate, a woman Taylor calls Nova, played by Linda Harrison. It's not long before Taylor turns the ape world upside down when, in one of the film's most memorable scenes, they discover he can actually speak. Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Today, the film is considered a science fiction classic, and rightly so. It's awesome. The story provides an interesting look at what our world would look like if humans did not evolve as the dominant species. It also explores themes of social equality, as while the apes claim to believe God created them equal, they have a strict caste system where gorillas are soldiers, chimpanzees are scientists, and orangutans are the ruling class. Some apes, it seems, are more equal than others. Heston, McDowell, and Hunter give some great performances, as does Maurice Evans as the orangutan Dr. Zaius. Jerry Goldsmith's score sounds fantastic. The makeup effects by John Chambers, while they haven't aged well, were incredibly impressive for the time. Chambers even won an honorary Academy Award for his work, the first makeup artist to do so. And, of course, there's that classic twist ending. I'm sure you're familiar with it, even if you haven't seen the movie, but just in case, spoiler alert, for an almost 50-year-old movie. Taylor and Nova ultimately escape their ape captors and travel along the coast, though Dr. Zaius warns Taylor he may not like what he finds. And what does he find? The remains of the Statue of Liberty. He didn't land on an alien planet. He was on Earth the whole time, a future version of Earth where humanity had all but wiped itself out, allowing apes to rise up and take over. God damn you all to hell! The movie was a huge hit, critically and commercially, and spawned four sequels between 1970 and 1973. One of them good, the rest not so much. But despite not always gaining critical acclaim, the sequels were all moneymakers for 20th Century Fox. There was also a live-action television series and a Saturday morning cartoon, both of which were short-lived due to low ratings. That brings us to the 1980s, when the powers that be at Fox decided it was time to revive the series with a new movie. Unfortunately, the project languished in development hell for over a decade. Initially, they hired independent director Adam Rifkin to make what would be called Return to the Planet of the Apes, a new sequel to the first movie that basically ignored the other sequels. And at first, they were going all out. Rick Baker would do the prosthetic makeup, Danny Elfman would compose the score, and Tom Cruise and Charlie Sheen were in contention for the lead role. But it ultimately fell through. In Rifkin's own words, it all seemed too good to be true. I soon found out it was. Then Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh pitched their own idea for a sequel and even had a character written for Roddy McDowell, who was quite willing to return to the series. But when Jackson met with Fox executive Tom Jacobson, who had no idea McDowell was in Planet of the Apes, Jackson realized this wasn't going to work and pissed off back to New Zealand. This worked out well for him. Over the next few years, the project had a revolving door of potential directors and producers, including Oliver Stone, James Cameron, Chris Columbus, Roland Emmerich, and Michael Bay. At one point, Arnold freaking Schwarzenegger was supposed to star in the movie, and they even took a second stab at getting Jackson back on board. But in the end, they all backed out. What we ultimately ended up with was a reimagining of Planet of the Apes rather than a remake or sequel, with a script by William Boyles Jr. and Tim Burton in the director's chair. How did it turn out? Eh, good in some ways, not so good in a lot of ways. 
This time around, instead of Charlton Heston on a mission to deep space, we have Marky Mark Wahlberg as Captain Leo Davidson, who is working on a space station in orbit around Saturn in 2029, teaching chimpanzees how to fly a spaceship. It goes about as well as you'd expect. I'm all for supporting the space program, but this is ridiculous. The weird thing is, everyone on this station refers to the chimp as a monkey rather than an ape. State-of-the-art monkey, you can handle it. Your monkey launches at 1600. Never send a monkey to do a man's job. These people are supposed to be scientists. You would think they'd know the difference between a monkey and an ape. Anyway, they encounter some kind of magnetic storm that appears to be transmitting every broadcast from Earth in history at the same time. Which sounds like the premise for a bad episode of Star Trek. They use Leo's chimp as a canary, and they lose it almost immediately because they're stupid. There's a surge in the heart rate, he's scared. Light him up again. Can't. Gone. Wow, they sure do look broken up over possibly sending an animal to its death. But Leo isn't about to let that chimp go without a fight, so he loosely places his helmet over his spacesuit, not bothering to seal it properly before he launches his pod. In the future, they're gonna send morons into space! And he flies into the magnetic storm and, after getting tossed around a bit, his pod's onboard calendar suddenly jumps ahead a few thousand years. Oh my god, he's traveled into the future! Now. You're probably wondering how his onboard computer could possibly know he's traveled into the future. So if you've seen the original movie, you have a pretty good idea of what happens next. He crashes his pod on a mysterious planet and runs into a group of wild humans who are being chased by damn dirty apes! Hey, haven't seen this in a while. It's a little known fact that apes have springs for legs. Oh hi, Linda Harrison. Leo gets captured and we get a good look at the planet of the apes as envisioned by Tim Burton. It looks quite different from the original. The ape civilization is a bit more advanced and the sets are more detailed. And Rick Baker's prosthetics are greatly improved over John Chambers' work. They look fantastic. Fox originally wanted to use CGI for the ape effects, but Burton stuck to his guns and insisted they use Baker's prosthetics. And I'd say he made the right call. Thanks to the more recent movies, we now know it is possible to do CGI apes well, but back in 2001, the technology wasn't there yet. Had they gone the CGI route, it would have looked awful. But not every decision Burton made was gold. Like many good sci-fi films, Schaffner's Planet of the Apes was loaded with social commentary on a variety of topics. The dangers of war and conquest, class structure, racism, religion versus science. In Burton's Planet of the Apes, most of that shit is done away with. The caste system in the original film is nowhere to be found here, as this is a more progressive ape society, if you will, and the chimps, gorillas, and orangutans are all on equal footing. There's even marriage between the species, though the mating rituals are... well... Let's just say they're a bit... odd. <laughs> you know what? Still better than the sex scenes in Fifty Shades. And the warmongering angle isn't really covered either because, unlike the original film, they're not on a future version of Earth where apes became the dominant species after humanity blew itself up. It's a completely different planet. So what sort of social commentary do we have? Well... Not much. The captured humans are sold as slaves by Paul Giamatti, but some are treated as pets rather than slaves, with collars and cages and whatnot. Which is weird. I mean, I kinda get what they're going for. It's clearly a callback to Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, where the humans initially used apes as pets, but over time they discovered the apes could be trained to perform menial tasks, and it evolved into slave labor. It's certainly not the only callback to the previous movies. Hey, your stinking hands off me, you damn dirty human! But it doesn't work as well in Burton's film. The apes often appear to be under the impression that humans are nothing more than big, dumb animals, but that's clearly not the case. These aren't the mute, primitive creatures we saw in Schaffner's film. They're exactly like humans in the real world. So all the talk of them being dumb animals rings pretty hollow. And because they seem to fit the functions of slave and pet interchangeably, I can't tell if Burton is trying to draw a parallel between slavery and racism or animal rights. Pick a metaphor and go with it, Tim.
The religion versus science aspect is also present in a way, though it's handled a bit differently and not really as any sort of commentary, but we'll get to that later. Leo makes a couple of friends after getting captured. There's a human girl called Dana, played by Estella Warren, who functions as the love interest of sorts. At least, that seems to be what they were going for. Unfortunately, these two have no chemistry whatsoever. This isn't helped by the fact that Dana's acting abilities are somewhat lacking. She basically has one facial expression throughout the entire movie. Dull surprise! <sighs> Every single time she's on camera. Dull surprise, dull surprise, dull fucking surprise. I know filming was rushed, but you'd think they could have found time to teach this girl how to emote just a little. Leo's other ally is a chimpanzee named Ari, played by Helena Bonham Carter. Or should that be Helena Bonobo Carter? <laughs> I'm not sorry. This character plays a similar role to Zira in the original film. She seems to be one of the few apes who actually respects the human's intelligence and lobbies for better treatment. And she also has a romantic interest in Leo. Yeah, you heard me. We essentially have a love triangle of sorts between Leo, Dana, and Ari. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but Tim Burton's a weird guy. Now, the romance between Leo and Ari is heavily downplayed compared to what Burton originally wanted. Reportedly, he actually had a love scene planned between the two, but Fox put the kibosh on that. They wouldn't even allow an implied love scene. But the interest is still pretty clear. Why did you help me? We are not usual. The smarter we get, the more dangerous our world becomes. Mm. I knew it. You're sensitive. It's an uncommon quality in a male. I'd like to see your world. Prod you and poke you and throw you in a cage, too. You protect me. Oh, she totally wants some of that man meat. And I think the feeling is mutual. Can you show me how we out of here? I promise you, I'll show you something that will change the world forever. He's talking about his penis. Eventually, Ari and a gorilla named Krull help Leo, Dana, and a few other humans escape. And thanks to a tracker Leo retrieves from his crashed pod, he realizes his people have come to rescue him. According to the apes, his tracker is pointing to a sacred place they call Kalima. So that's where they're headed. But they have some very dangerous apes hot on their heels. Atta, a gorilla played by Michael Clark Duncan, and General Thade, a chimpanzee played by Tim Roth. And while Duncan makes a pretty damned intimidating gorilla, I can't say I was a big fan of Roth in this movie. It's not so much Roth himself I have a problem with as the character he's portraying. Thade is just way too over the top. He's not really a villain, he's a caricature of a villain. Always snarling and sneering and creeping around and speaking in a proto-Christian Bale Batman voice. And I'm sorry, it's just too much. He's trying way too hard to be intimidating and it borders on the hilarious. And every once in a while, he has to remind us that he's evil, as if it wasn't obvious. <laughs> Well, you just spilled half your dinner on the floor, so you all lose. And if that wasn't enough, he apparently has the hots for Ari. He hates everything she stands for, and she feels likewise about him, but she's the daughter of a senator, and I guess that's good enough for him. Not so much for her, however. You feel so much for these humans, yet you feel nothing for me. That's because you're an asshole. Eventually, he finally gets the hint, but decides if he can't have her, no one can and he quite literally brands her a traitor. Does he always keep a hot branding iron handy? Just in case? Who does he think he is, Terry Funk? Anyway, after passing by another reference to the original movie, Leo and company finally arrive at Kali Ma. And here's where we get our big reveal of how the Planet of the Apes came to be. This movie's Statue of Liberty moment, if you will. Remember that science versus religion thing? Well, according to ape religion, Kalima is where creation began with the first ape, Simos, who is essentially their Jesus. Several apes believe in this myth, though some of the more educated, like Ari, assume it's all just superstition and nonsense. It turns out the truth lies somewhere in between. Hey, it doesn't say Kalima, it says Voyager 6. Oh, wait, no, it says Caution Live Animals. Yes, it turns out Leo's space station also crash-landed on this planet when they tried to rescue him. But thanks to some wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff, it somehow got here a few thousand years before Leo. And everything on the ship still works. Which I refuse to believe. 
If that was anything like our current technology, that shit would have had a one year warranty and broken down a few days after it expired. After playing the video logs, our heroes discover the apes that were brought here by Leo's crew eventually went apeshit and killed their human masters. And the ape who led the carnage was named, you guessed it, Simos. So the humans inadvertently started this civilization by bringing the first apes to the planet. So where did the horses come from? There weren't any on the ship. Did an animal identical to an earth horse just happen to evolve on this planet? Because that's one hell of a coincidence. Well, unexplained presence of horses aside, this isn't a terrible idea, but it doesn't hold a candle to the original. Instead of humanity wiping itself out with nuclear war, an idiot followed a chimp into a time portal. The planet of the apes came to be due to plain old fashioned stupidity. It just doesn't have the same impact. I'm responsible for all of this. Yep, you're the asshole. At least to the humans, to the apes, you're technically God. Man, that's gotta be a huge disappointment. I am your God. <laughs> While all this nonsense is going on, Thade is having a moment with his dying father, Zaius, played by an uncredited Charlton Heston. And so we've come full circle. He even gets to repeat one of his famous lines. Damn them all to hell! And much like Zaius in the original movie, he knows the truth about the origins of his people and the role the humans played in it, and the role they could play should they return to prominence. And he passes this information on to his son just before he dies. This is actually a pretty well done scene and easily one of the movie's high points. Even Roth's overacting is toned down to a more tolerable level, and the end result is a touching moment between father and son, while also foreshadowing terrible things to come. It's remarkable that the scene came together as well as it did, considering Heston and Roth did not exactly see eye to eye on a number of things. Roth feels very strongly about gun control, and Heston was pretty much the polar opposite, being the president of the NRA at the time. In fact, Roth stated that had he known ahead of time that he'd be sharing a scene with Heston, he wouldn't have taken the part. But ultimately, he decided it wouldn't be professional to argue with Heston about this on set, as that sort of argument doesn't belong in the workplace. So they put politics aside and did their job. And the movie was better for it. Not a lot better, mind you, but I'll take it. This all leads up to a final confrontation between the apes and the humans. Fortunately, Leo's got some more friends to help out, as the various human villages have all heard about the man who defies the apes. Question. How? They don't exactly have Twitter on this planet. They don't have electricity. So the only way such a message could be delivered is the old-fashioned way. But who the hell are the messengers? It can't be Leo and his buddies since they're too busy running away, and the apes certainly aren't going to spread the word, nor are they going to let their human slaves do so. So how do these humans even know that Leo exists? What am I missing here? Do you think this might be a day for night shot? I can't tell. It's over. There's no help coming. You came. Yes, I'm sure he did. So after a huge and occasionally explosive battle, and the sudden appearance of Leo's chimp, whom the apes mistake for the second coming of Simos, the truth of the apes' history is revealed, Fade is imprisoned in the ship, and the apes and humans decide to live the rest of their days in harmony and peace. Yep, just like that. War's over. Don't you wish all conflicts could be resolved so easily? And Leo decides his work is done here and flies his happy ass back in time. And then we have the twist ending. Ooh boy. Leo returns safely to Earth in his own time, but after landing in the middle of Washington, D.C., he notices something is not quite right. Oh my god! I have no idea what's going on! I mean, I get that they were in some way paying tribute to the book, and this is much closer to the book's ending than the original movie, but how the hell have the apes taken over present-day Earth? How did Abe Lincoln become Ape Lincoln? Why does this green screen shot look so fucking bad? And why is the Ape Lincoln statue a monument for... General... Bade? What? I can't even pretend to understand this. And I'm not alone. 
General Fade himself, Tim Roth, was quoted as saying, I cannot explain that ending. I have seen it twice, and I don't understand anything. You and me both, Tim. But here's the real kicker. According to Mr. Burton, the ending was not supposed to make sense. Mission accomplished, I guess. Burton stated he wanted the movie to end on a nonsensical cliffhanger, as that would allow someone else to make a sequel should Fox desire one. Because after the miserable experience he had making Planet of the Apes, he was done. When someone asked him if he'd consider sticking around for the sequel, he responded, I'd rather jump out a window. Can't say I blame him. Now, I would think it would have been easier for another filmmaker to make a sequel based on a cliffhanger that did make sense, but what do I know? So that's Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. Critical reviews were mixed at best, and the movie won the Razzie for Worst Remake or Sequel, while Charlton Heston and Estella Dull Surprise Warren also won Razzies for their supporting roles. Despite lacking critical acclaim, the movie made a shitload of money and had the second highest opening weekend of the year behind the first Harry Potter film. And while Burton wasn't coming back for a follow-up, several actors, including Wahlberg, Carter, and Giamatti, were willing to reprise their roles. But for whatever reason, Fox decided against a sequel and rebooted the franchise in 2011. And considering how well the rebooted series has done, critically and commercially, it looks like they made the right decision. Burton's Planet of the Apes may have been quite profitable, but it's kind of a mess. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say it's horrible, as it does have a lot of things working in its favor. Visually, it looks fantastic, a few questionable special effects aside. The sets and costumes look great. The makeup effects are amazing. Danny Elfman's score is pretty good. And some of the performances are very well done. On the other hand, some of the performances are not so well done. The story leaves much to be desired. And the ending... just... the hell. Overall, I'd call this one mediocre. If you haven't seen it, you really don't need to go out of your way to do so. Just stick to the original. And the new movies aren't bad either. Next time, we're going to look at a different sort of animal. One with a tendency to explode. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.